Very nice to see that there's so many people. There's actually two of us on stage today. So hi, everybody. My name is Ursula Koski. I'm the CTO for AWS for the Nordic countries. So I serve the partner space, so the partner organizations. Um, that's my daytime role. So that's my normal daytime role. Uh, I'm an architect. I'm technical. Um, my technical areas are basically banking, hospitals, and surprise, surprise, casinos. But I brought a colleague with me. Oh, uh, yeah. <laughs> hey. While they're looking into the technical problems, I can't help with that at all. I work for AWS. I work for AWS in the Nordics. I'm actually a sales. Don't shoot me. I know, we're boring. <laughs> Comic relief. Uh, but that is, as Ursula said, my daytime job. My nighttime job, I work with ID&E. Inclusion, diversity, equity, belonging, sustainability. We also have a booth out there. Come and talk to us about those topics because we're actually doing a lot and we can't do it alone. We need to have all of you on board to achieve those goals that we all want to achieve. We're going to talk about it a little bit later. But I'm a co-lead for Glamazon, LGBTQ plus community. I'm a board member of Women At because we need more women in STEM and we can't do it without the men on board. And I'm a board member of Ben, the Black Employee it's Network. Long, it's long, isn't it? Did we solve the technical challenges? I hope so. Good, because I'm done. <laughs> yes, so Back to you, Ursula. Let's see. No. All right. Well, then we have to freestyle it. Oh, we're good at that. Yeah, so no worries. Um, so do you want to use this? No. We can freestyle it, no worries. So it doesn't look like. Yeah. It's fine. We'll freestyle. So the topic I wanted to talk to you about today, and I was thinking like, it's early morning, everybody had a cup of coffee, and I was like, culture of innovation at Amazon Web Services, powered by sustainability and ID&E. Whoa, it? Ursula, stop here. That's way too much. You know, it's, it's early morning, please make it clear what this is all about. All right, so what is it about? And why do we talk about sustainability and ID&E continuously? So I know that there are key words that you hear floating around here and there. And then the question is, what is sustainability? Why do I have to care about sustainability? What does ID&E have to do with it? And you're a techie. Why are you talking about this? Well, we all want the world to live a little bit longer than it is looking like now. But how does sustainability and ID&E have anything to do with each other? Well, it's very simple. If we want to create, for example, smart cities, we need to do that with diverse minds. Because if we're all thinking the same, how is it going to be a smart city? It's only catered for one type of person. We need to cater for all. We need to be inclusive. And in order to do that, we need to have diverse teams. But OK, does that mean if I hire somebody who doesn't look like me, I've done my job? No. It's much more than that. You know that, Ursula. All right. So then again, explain to me sustainability and ID&E. How do they relate? One goes with the other hand in hand and cannot live without the other. So would you say that if you look at innovation, if you look at the tech industry, and you look at the audience that we have here, whether you're a techie, infra, developer, decision maker, sales, sales, Innovation, inspiration actually boils down to do you have enough diversity? Do you have different minds, different people at the workplaces? Would you say so? I think you are half a touch of it. Yeah. But the other touch of it, and this is one thing that I really love, and I love that they took it up in the opening as well. We need to fail. In order to innovate, we need to fail. And one of the examples that I love to use when I'm talking about this with my customers, with my colleagues, is who has heard about the Amazon Fire Phone? Anybody? Anybody. Yes, I see hands. OK, yeah. Does it still exist? <clears throat> it was a failure. Let's be realistic. But we fail fast, right? Yeah, we do. Cheap? And you know, and we know what Can we, we did with cheap? it? I can't answer that. <laughs> you know what we did with the mistakes that we have learned from making the Fire Phone? is that all the speech technology that was used in there is now the basis 
of Alexa. So you would say that you find a way that doesn't work to build another way that will work. Exactly. So if you look at innovation these days, so it feels like a battlefield. So all the companies are competing who will be the fastest, who will create a product. How do you know that there's a need for a product? So how do you need certain innovation? Is it a product? Is it a tech thing? Is it a new gadget? Here's a new gadget for you. Or could it be something else? It is also working backwards from your customer. You know that. Yeah. That's what we do constantly. Yeah. But you start with the customer first. So we talk about customer obsession. And we talk about innovation, inspiration, etc. But when you look at um, the numbers, the numbers speak actually a different language. So, yes, we need wider pool of expertise. We need different kinds of people in order to have that expertise in-house. We also need to reduce the risk of failing, even though we need to allow the possibility to fail when you innovate. Um, you need to get the faster cycle of innovation. But then there's numbers. Remind me again. Uh, they're actually speaking for themselves. 84% of... CEOs believe that innovation is critical, 84%. So we can agree with that. Innovation is important. We have to be the fastest, brightest, etc. Okay. Then you have another one. 80% of the business models are at risk. So you have businesses that think that they might be outdated. So you have to be faster than the competition. Cool. All right. And then 6% of the CEOs are satisfied with their innovative performance. Six. Six. Not 60, six. Six percent. Six percent. Okay. So it's a lot of experimentation in order to succeed. So you need a faster cycle. And sometimes you have to accept in order to fail, you might have to spend money. Do you have any failed experiments that you could actually tell me about when you say IDE, diversity, inclusion, equity, belonging, has contributed to either failing or succeeding? If you look at like the automobile industry, is there anything that you would say that innovation is lacking because there is no diversity? Crash test dummies, for example. Oh, yes. I love that example. Do you know? that when a woman ends up in a car crash, she's 74% more likely to be seriously injured compared to a man. That's a scary number, 74%. Why? Because the car crash test dummies that they're using, I'm diverse, this is a word I cannot pronounce, you know what I mean, the dummies that they put in and go like, beep, those. They were built and developed based on an average man. Therefore, when a woman who's shorter, smaller, she will be heavy injured when she comes in an accident. No diverse development. Yeah, but then again, in order to find the failures, so, so we need to be able to bring in enough people that have different kind of thinking models who actually can point out, hang on, that may not actually work in this case. It can be body size, it can be skin color, it can be many different things. It can be also disabilities. So, for example, if I'm in a wheelchair and I go through an airport, I may not be able to pass through certain gates or security inspections because I can't access it. So accessibility being part of it. And that means you're losing part of the market if you are not thinking about it. We have another beautiful example on that from Microsoft itself, or from Microsoft, what am I saying now? From Amazon itself. Amazon, when they launched uh, part of their store focusing on hair care products, that store was developed by white people. There was no offering for any hair type for black people. No products, no nothing. It is actually our affinity group, Ben, the Black Employee Network, who said, hey, 
What are you doing? We need to have a section of that store. So they started their own store within Amazon. And that was more profitable than the products that were being sold for people with hair like you and I. Why? We weren't diverse. We weren't thinking. So there's a business need. So then again, sometimes it might be outlier cases. So we were doing product testing for a, it's, it's basically a sports instrument. So a sports watch. And we got complaints from uh, different individuals saying like, it's not working, it's not functional. One of them being me. And they looked at me and was like, it should work. Yeah, why not? And then we actually went through uh, various testing phases and found out I'm too white. So sorry. And then I had a colleague who was like, I'm too black. So you need the test group. You need those minds. You need to figure out what's happening. So, so we need diverse testing. But what about data? So, so if you look at data these days, because for example, if you look at organizations around us, if you look at Nordea, data-driven organization, is there a risk if we have a lot of data that that's not diverse enough? Yes, there is. And that can, for example, for Nordea or within the financial services, within the insurance services, that can be a very high risk. Let's say health insurance. You can't access the data. You can scramble the data, you can anonymize the data, but you can't get a proper overview without being biased. And that's the challenge we're having as well. Biased data. And how do you mitigate the bias of that data in order to have data models that will function in the majority of the cases? Will they be perfect? Are we actually perfect? <laughs> I wish I was. My husband tells me that I am. <laughs> I think he has a different reason for saying that. She's my sister, so yeah, she's perfect. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, so we won't be perfect, but we have to start actually building things that will have much more diverse data. We also have to mitigate the risk of not having that bias in that data set. So the question is, of course, why do innovations then fail? So we know all this. We need more diverse minds. We need different age groups, cultural groups. We need different life experiences. But there must be a reason why innovations fail. Any ideas? Anybody? Any ideas? Why do they fail? I know we're in Finland. <laughs> Can we please get some people to s put up their hands? Give me some answers. Why do they fail? Can I Anybody? Promise Any ideas? Some swag? If somebody needs yeah. to put up the... Oh, okay. Let's we have see. some nice swag. Yeah, so you'll get a swag if you... That is, that is one of the reasons, so you have to test, so that is a good point. You will get a swag, join us after the um, session. Who else? Anybody the ice else? is broken, come on, anybody else? Innovations, products, I have the best product ever. I have an innovation, it will be great, and then the whole audience says, nobody needs that. No market. Yeah, no market need. So most typical reason is that I have a great idea and the market says, no. Want to hear a perfect example of this? Amazon, so the main web shop introduced a feature called, I think it was called like a shadow buyer. I, I don't remember, it doesn't really matter. Shadow buyer meaning somebody just like you. So somebody just like Ursula who's going to do buying. Same books, same products. People hated it. They absolutely said, no way. Nobody's like me. Uh, so that's a good experimentation of the idea was beautiful. So for example, recommendations, there's a buyer just like you. No, we don't want that. Very typical reason, run out of cash. Um, I worked for a uh, innovation company that was creating a universal compiler, a beautiful idea from code to code to language to language to universal compiling. And we had the most amazing experts who did all kinds of security algorithms. The only thing was we had 5 million. We probably would have needed 500 million. <laughs> so not enough money to fuel the fire in order to get to the end result. So eventually it will, yeah, 
it will fail. What else? Well, if you're not working with the right team. Yeah. We just talked about that. Yeah. You need to have the right team, but you also need to have a team that can push back. That can say, hey, I don't agree. I think there should be another way to go about it. Or that can say, have hard discussions, but at the end of the day, still have the same goal, and that end goal needs to be there. So not having the right team is one of the top reasons why innovation fails. Yeah, and it's not about having the clones of you in the same team. No, not at all. So, Actually, quite the opposite. Exactly. So you need to have that debate of what works, what doesn't, and also somebody who says no. You say no to me often. Quite a lot, yes. Yeah. I love saying no to you. Yeah, but then again, then you luck around the stuff with me and, and yeah. do the boost and things. So then again, it's a balance. So then there's a question of um, when we start with customer working backwards, we see that there's actually a market need. We start to innovate, we start to build awesome, beautiful. Um, that's the basis of the, how the business, the cultural inno innovation is driven. And we do it with diverse teams. But how does that work with us? So if you look at the um, products that we deliver, we aim to deliver more on the experience and also the emotional setting than just having the nicest, fastest, most amazing, shiny swag. Would you agree? Minimum lovable product. But then again, what is a good business practice? What do you think that would be a good business practice when it comes to products and innovation? Challenge. What do you think it is? So if you look at the customer satisfaction, so if you have that satisfied customers and you actually have the product that somebody needs, hopefully, a satisfied customer, that would be the most important starting point. Is there anything else that is important? Best of brand? Best of brand is very much important, but do share why. Well, if you look at the products that we are creating, we also put in a lot of effort at that. We talk about experience. So there's no compression algorithm for experience and running it over and over again and testing it over and over again. We talk about resilience, building a resilient business that will pull through anything. So if you look at the prime days, so those of you who haven't uh, seen what a prime day is, so when the Amazon shop has a deep discount days, there's so many people buying online. Do you know what happens when there's so many people buying online? You also see crashes and you have to test for resiliency. What we do is a continuous improvement cycle. So how do you keep the services alive and going and running? And yeah, we do fail sometimes. Oh yeah, we do. So there are sometimes outages, but we improve each cycle and that's the experience. But then we actually come back to the sustainability and idea need. Big words but I don't actually like them that much. So if you talk about sustainability, people see it as uh, the green of how do you keep this globe alive? How do we keep us running? But you also see a lot of money put into the efforts of, hey, let me offset my cost. I'm traveling, let yeah. me offset my cost with money. Uh, there's a certain amount of money that you can use, still one globe. So I would say I would rather use having a future um, then talking about just sustainability when it comes to the green. The idea need that's quite a lot. Inclusion, diversity, equity. Don't forget the belonging. Yeah, but what does it really mean? So what is inclusion if you look at teams? If I'm joining your team, what is inclusion? It means that you get accepted as you are. So I can join. Yay! Quite boring. Right? Yeah, I know. Yeah? I know. So diversity, of course, means that we have different kind of individuals, so not everybody is like a same clone of each other. But what does it mean? Is there anything else inside it? Diversity. Diversity is also diversity of mind. It is diversity of nationality, culture, background, religion, all of that. And it is about learning from each other. It's about being curious, asking questions, and trying to understand where another person is coming from. That is diversity for me. 
So if you look at the Amazonian culture, we actually have said we embrace all. I know that there are also companies who say, for example, when it comes to cultural experience, religious experiences, we embrace none. So they, that doesn't exist. That's also one practice of doing it, of being fair, of there won't be any religious holidays, holidays that we recognize. That's one way of going about it. But then there's the equity, and that seems to be a very hard uh, word to understand. Um, how does equity relate, if you look at belonging, if you look at like me being part of the team, what is equity? Equity, and there a lot of people still make the mistakes between equality. Because equity does not mean equal. Equity means that you will support everybody so that they rise up to the same level. That is equity. Helping each other, getting there, with what that right person needs at that time to move forward, to make sure that he gets up to the same as his colleagues. That's equity. So it's not always the same same if no. I don't have the same needs. So for example, a topic that we don't so often talk about in Finland, for example, is neurodiversity. It doesn't mean that all employees need exactly the same services because not everybody is neurodiverse. But if you have neurodiverse, employees, you have to cater to those needs in order to get to equity. I'm going to give you an example of that. I just mentioned it. I'm neurodiverse. I'm dyslexic. I can speak very well. Don't ask me to write. You won't be able to read it. Neither can I afterwards. So it actually means that I need special software on my computer that will enable to translate whatever I write that is readable for everybody else. Do you need that? No, that's not actually what I need, but it could be that my experience is different. So uh, I have a different kind of neurodiversity. And um, one of the unique things is that if I would ask the audience, how many of you see numbers in colors? So how many would raise their hand? So my nine is blue. And then people go like, ooh, ooh, it's <laughs> I have synesthesia. And it's actually a really cool skill to have if you're debugging code. So you go through the code and you're like, boom, there, there, there. And I may have multiple screens and you say, oh, terror is there. So it was like a superpower. So actually my previous company was competing over that they can send me to do my magic because I found the mistake very quickly. And I found the mistake also in code that wasn't mine or even in a language that I don't write myself. And then they're like, oh, it's magic. No. No? And it can be sometimes very challenging because I see them in colors. Do you see numbers in colors? I do. Yeah. And you know that. Yeah. I do. But one of the benefits from me having dyslexia, I speak seven languages fluently. I can't write them, but I can have a wonderful conversation with you. And it is my superpower. And it took me for a very, very long time to be able to stand on stage and say, hey, here, yeah, there's a chip off. <laughs> but it works for me. And also that needs to be something that in companies we embrace because it is superpowers that we have. And we need them in teams to have those diverse mindsets. And one of the part of belonging is to be able to be your true self. And that is actually in the core of what we talk about. So like mentioned, we have daytime roles and then we have something that we call our passion projects inside AWS and Amazon. So we are actually co-leaders for Clemson. You will see all the bright flags and all the colors uh, when you walk out from this door. Uh, so you have communities that support people who are like you, so inside that company, and allow you to be yourself. We actually have quite a bit of communities. How many do we have at the moment? I think the last time it was 13 or 14. Something like that. So you have the veterans, people who may experience PTSD after war, uh, you have Black Employee Network, we have Clemson, we are co-leading it for the whole Nordic and actually currently for the Baltics. Once Baltics is, is ramping up, then we will hand it over to Baltics. Um, women at. Women at. Neurodiversity. Exactly. So there's a multitude of communities. 
So in order to have that sense of belonging and have that shared experience, you need people around you who are similar. But let's put it in practical terms. If you feel that you don't belong to the workplace, if you can't actually share your experiences as a person, you are a caricature. So for me, I've been an architect or developer or any kind of techie role for now 25 years, and considering I'm 27, that is uh, many, many years. <laughs> I started very young. Um, no, I'm not 27, oh, so they say. Um, but a big part of my career was like, don't be like that. Don't be neurodiverse. Also, the fact I'm gay, I'm openly gay, and I talk about it. I'm sea level, and I'm gay. How many you think in Finland can say that? Very few. Same with me. I'm gay, although I'm married to a husband, I have three children. I talk about this with my customers. Why? Because I want to create awareness. My youngest child is trans. I had a hard time with that myself. Although people would say, yeah, but you're gay. I understand the struggles that they are going through, and I want to create a safe workplace for them in the future. When I hear stories that my youngest son has to run in a country like Norway, away from situations to be safe, that scares me. And then we as companies, large companies, have a responsibility to stand up and say, no, this we cannot accept. And that is what we drive with our affinity groups. We have conversations with our C-levels. We have conversations in the boardrooms. We set policies together with HR to be more inclusive throughout the hiring process, to set standards within the company where everybody can accept. And I hope that this is part of the message that all of you will take with you to your respective company and start those type of discussions as well because we need to cater to all, to our customers, to our partners, to our colleagues. And sometimes it's a question of zero tolerance because there are certain things that are not acceptable. So it can be any kind of phobia. It can be the fact that uh, you're, you, know, you can put any phobia and any brand in the front and we say, that's zero tolerance. So it's because I have my biases, and that's also a topic that we talk about a lot and broadly in our teams, because there's an understanding of, hey, we need to embrace everybody, and that's normal for everybody, right? Sure. Of course, I have no biases, right? That's not true. Everybody has biases. And the most awful thing is once you realize, hang on, I have a bias. I actually, I'm not comfortable with this situation. So we talk about those biases in order to change the world. And I know that it sounds very bold, but in order to have that experience, you have to have those discussions. And sometimes those discussions are really difficult. Having discussions like, I don't trust you, I don't know you, this is different from me, yeah. So, so those experiences. So if you look at the why, you have to start with the personal why. So you have to have a strong enough personal why. And there's a saying, and now I'm wondering if I remember it correctly, who said it originally. The person who has a strong enough why can withstand any kind of how, almost any kind of how. So if I have a reason to do something, I can withstand pretty much anything. And this year has probably shown us that. So if you look at this year, the war, if you look at all the turmoil around us, if you have strong enough why, why you get out of bed, you have any how in order to get there. But of course, we need to change, and we need to also change ourselves and the way that we talk. And yeah, also here, not being perfect, accepting not being perfect and making mistakes. Also the way you speak. And then sometimes you have to say, I'm so sorry, I made a mistake. And I can make mistakes of ridiculous things because it's not in my experience. So my why is basically wanting to change myself, having that sense of belonging in my team, is there something that you want to say about your why before we talk about the, the broader topic of does it make sense? Well, I think I already shared quite a lot of my why, but we need to do it together. 
We can't do it all on our own. That's just the last thing I wanted to add to that. But then one might say, this is all nice, this is all beautiful. That's so cool. Does it make business sense? Oh yeah, it does. This? Are you sure? Oh yeah, I am. Research has shown that. Yeah. And not from one source, but from several sources. I can give you an example. When you hire an employee, the return on investment that you do takes you two years. Two years. To become profitable. Yeah. So the return on investment, two years. Now, if that person does not feel a sense of belonging, they will leave usually one year, two months. That's about the average that they leave. That's a big gap. That's a lot of money. When that person is foreign, he will leave after seven months. It's even more money. So that's already business sense. Yeah, but also research shows, if you look at companies who are seen as inclusive in culture, but there you have to be mindful about what is inclusive enough, because this is also not a competition or race, it's not an activity where you say, like what we often see is that when you do pride events, for example, when we get to pride month in Finland, everybody goes like, pride, yay, and then it's like after pride month, hmm. No, you have to do continuous efforts. But if your culture is truly inclusive and people have the sense of belonging, you are two times as likely to meet or exceed your financial targets. And also three times as likely to be high achieving or high performing when it comes to a target. Anything else that you would like to highlight? We've been talking about innovation. You're six times more likely to innovate and be agile. And then there was one more. You're eight times more likely to achieve better business outcomes. That's quite something. But okay, so we all know this. We have the studies to prove it. Is it easy? So no. let's say if I start creating that team, that diverse team, I start hiring, there's a tipping point. So let's say that I start changing the way my team looks. So we have different backgrounds, we have different generations, we have different people, different minds. The tipping point is seen by the research to be around 25% of just having, let's take just the male, female. So if it's completely male or female oriented industry, 25% of either you know, changing that balance of going from 100% of something to having 25%, that's the tipping point. Then you start seeing the change where you perform better. But think about it, that's only one group. Then you have the intersectional side of things. So how do you in add enough and enough and build that inclusive culture so that's not an accident that will happen? And of course, one thing that people tend to forget, yes, studies show this, but actually maintaining that culture is even harder. So you have to maintain the culture and have that feeling of belonging. And that can change rapidly also with difficult years. And on top of that, it should not only be driven from a C-suite. It actually should be driven from the workforce as a general. It's not the C-suite that has to set the rules. It's the workforce in general that has to set the engagement. And that happens also through storytelling. So I can give you an example. I think I was like two months in, in AWS. I went in front of the whole Nordics um, leadership team, extended leadership team, and I shared my journey, I shared my personal journey. It was about maybe 15 minutes of session sharing about my journey. Everybody was silent, like completely silent. And I was thinking like, ooh, this is going bad. This is really bad. And when I stopped and I was at the end of my story, the person who's leading the whole team stood up and said, thank you. Thank you for sharing. Thank you to be brave enough to share your story. But that's also true examples. We can build the belonging. And the risk that you're taking is always a personal risk. But this is also a company that many of our employees say, what do you say about this company? This is the first one to... Where I can be truly myself that will support me and that doesn't really care about who I am in a positive way. 
They don't care that I'm neurodiverse. They will support me. They will give me the tools that I have equality to everybody else. They don't care that I'm gay because for them it doesn't matter. They will support me to be who I truly am and bring my true self to work. So that's quite significant. So how can you put a value on that? But then there's the question. Cool, you have your why, you have your reasoning. How about your why? How do people find that? Asking questions, introspection, dare to have a discussion with your colleagues at home, with friends, and find your why. And come and talk to us at the booth. Yeah. So, Happy to help you. Yeah. And if you're thinking about starting your, let's say, sustainability journey or IDE &E journey, the thing about building culture or changing culture in companies, happy to help. We're also happy to share on where we have maybe failed at some yes. point. So your why is very crucial in order to actually get yourself moving and changing. One of the challenges that we often see with different companies and different size companies is the higher you get, the more frozen people tend to get with oh, I could make a mistake. I could say something wrong, and then I will be punished for that for years and years. So that's also something that you have to get moving in order to change something. So finding your why is very critical. Then we get to the point of call to action, because, you know, what would it be without a call to action? So one thing that I would like to highlight is the fact that I hear, and we hear too often, that when people talk about these topics, ID&E, sustainability, they say it's the right thing to do. And it is, don't get me wrong. But then we hear it's not measurable. Is it measurable? It is measurable. And that's the point. Most of the things that we do, regardless of data bias, the product innovation, the diverse products, it is measurable, but sometimes Painfully so. Like the 6% number of are the company CEOs happy with the innovation cycle and the pace of innovation. That's a painful number to accept. And it's a painful number to open up and show to people, hey, this is where we are at. Most of things are miserable and you can put a value and a timeline on them. And I think concerning timeline, I see Rolf getting... It looks, Ready. Like, it looks like that we are almost at time. So basically, I think here, we will be here all day. And um, we have a booth that you can take your pictures, having some fun with colleagues. Do we have anything that we want to ask the audience? Is there still a challenge to get some swag or are we good? Come and talk to us. We'll Come see. and yeah. challenge us. Yeah. Ask difficult questions. We are um, ready to learn as well. Exactly. So thank you so much for having us and can't wait to talk to you. Thank you.